morning. Good morning. Maybe. Ah, uh, now we're live. God is doing something. God is doing something, and we get a chance to be a part of it. And I am just thankful for this chance to gather together. And if you'll bear with me, I'm not only going to be praying for us, but let's uh, let's pray for the world, shall we? Gracious and Heavenly Father, Lord, we do bring ourselves to you. And, of course, we're going to start there. We're going to start with who we are and, and all the distractions, all the busyness, all the things that might otherwise get in our way. We just, as best as we can, we put those aside and we say, here we are for you. But, Lord, I do want to pray a special prayer for those who couldn't be here this morning and, for great, frankly, for the vast number of folks that are still sleeping in their homes, unaware that the divine is happening that you are alive and active, Lord, that you would Hallelujah. rest us all from our slumber, Hallelujah. that you would wake us to what you are doing in the world, that we might be part of that, not only to join you in your work, but to celebrate your glory and to be able to be a part of it is beyond reckoning. So we thank you for this chance in Jesus' precious name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stir a passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow. Stir a passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow. Stir a passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow.
given so much through the finished works of Jesus Christ and the cross. He has given us all things. Do you know that you have his authority here? His authority here now. This is not going to be in something to come. He says all power and authority have been given to you. Now go. I think that we need to exercise our authority, amen? We need to exercise our authority. But you can only do that if you know what that authority gives you. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Do you know that when you say in your mouth, I am or I only am, that you're giving power to either Satan or you're giving power to God. There's a scripture in the Bible, I wish I had it here to give to you this morning, but you can look it up, you can find it. It says that we are going to be judged by the words of our mouth because we are creative beings. We are made in the image of the Most High. And how did he create? 
he said. Don't give away your power, folks. You have power of attorney from the Most High God, your Father, your Redeemer. Hallelujah to his name. Hallelujah to his name. Hallelujah to his name. Praise his name. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. We're called to meditate on the majesty of the Lord. And on your wondrous works. His works are around us. The heavens declare the glory of God. There was a glorious sunrise this morning. Man shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and will declare, mouth again, your greatness, Lord. They shall utter, mouth again, the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. Psalms 145 verses 5 through 7. If you need a verse this morning to hang on to, something that makes you want to say something different in your life and in the loved ones around you, Psalm 145, 5 through 7. You shall say, you shall declare, you shall utter, you shall sing. And we're singing this morning about the saving grace, the awesomeness of his name his mighty acts, his wondrous grace. Praise and glory to him. Praise and glory to him. Praise and glory to the Most High, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to him who is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you, O oh God, for the sign of your love, for when Christ has died and is now gone above. We praise you, O oh God, for your spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory.
Revive us again. Revive us, Lord. Revive us. Hallelujah. so good to us. Our God is so good to us. Psalm 42 1 is where this song is taken. David talking about the Lord being what his spirit desires more than anything. Is your spirit seeking after God? Things of the Lord? It says that he will fill those that thirst and hunger after him. Are you thirsty for what God has to give? The things that only he can fill you with. Things of goodness. The word says, come taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, he wants to bless his children. He wants to bless us with all good things. Hallelujah. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my strength, desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you. You know, usually we think of worship as being in this place right here. Worship is what's going to go out the door with you this morning. Worship is going to continue with you into Monday 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and hopefully right back here to this place again on Sunday. What we do here in this space together, this is powerful. This is beautiful. But what you relinquish to the Lord once you leave this place, that is worship. Worshiping with your movement, with your eyes, bringing all thought captive and underneath his guidance. Hallelujah. As we lift up your name, as we lift up your name, let your fire fall, let your fire fall, send you wind and you rain, send your wind and your rain, on your wings of love, on your wings of love, pour out from heaven your passion and presence, bring down your moment of time right now to go into call to community. Greet each other around you. Find somebody new or someone that you haven't said hello to for in a while and uh, say good morning. We're going to have the announcements come on at the end of this time. So when you hear those announcements start to roll, know that that's our time of coming back together to be able to prepare ourselves to hear for Pastor Bill's message this morning. Enjoy.
Good morning. We are so glad that you are here. Welcome to that last Sunday in January of 2022. And we are still kind of in, I don't know about you, but I know in my household, we are still in the establishing of some new routines um, as the new year hit. And uh, we are doing that also here at Linwood Friends. And what I mean by that is I'm going to remind you once again <laughs> to complete that connection card. So take a moment right now, fill out the connection card or hop online and do it digitally as well. It continues to be the best way for us to know that you're here, um, but also any information that may have changed and for us to stay in connection. So we really want you to be able to build this routine of filling out a connection card on Sundays. It's also a great place and we will continue to challenge or encourage you to find a prayer that you can share mark that on your connection card or if you're doing digitally you can go straight to the prayer request digital prayer request or the digital connection card either way but share a prayer whether it's mundane or it's deep and heavy please share your prayers with us and if you haven't received if you did not receive last week the week's prayers and you would like to be on that list receiving the prayers that come in each week make sure that we have your email and that you make a note star it and just say i really want to receive the prayers the prayer list and we'll make sure that you get on that list so take a moment fill that out if you're doing it digitally submit you're done uh, if you're physically here make sure that you drop that in, on your way out in the basket and in terms of other announcements coming up this week wednesday we are once again i guess is the way to say it <laughs> We are having our Wednesday conversations. Um, we had to kind of put off our start to it a couple weeks ago as we needed to follow health protocols and Pastor Bill's home, um, but we're doing it. And this is the week that it continues. So this Wednesday, Wednesday conversations, 630 at Pastor Bill's house. It's a nice opportunity to just kind of talk about matters of faith and a nice, easy conversation. If you need address, directions, hints on best places to park or whatever it might be, you can contact Pastor Bill. You can call the church number and it will forward to him, or you can also email him and get that information. Let's see what else is happening at the end of this week, the 4th and the 5th, it is Northwest Yearly Meetings Mid-Year Gathering. And we are a part of a collection of friends churches in this region, and it's the Mid-Year Gathering, and it's all happening online. So it's a wonderful opportunity to find out what is happening in that greater element of church in our region and area and already on your calendar you may have marked sunday february 13th it's super bowl sunday <laughs> this sunday is playoffs we'll find out who's going but super bowl sunday is coming up and in the past sometimes uh, linwood friends has hosted whether in a home or at church a wonderful gathering time and this year um, bill and penny krueger are hosting a Super Bowl watching party at their place. So you can join them at three. And if you need address information uh, or secrets of where to park, <laughs> et cetera, you can contact Penny and that will be happening. Bring a snack to share uh, for your viewing pleasure and come and enjoy watching the game, the commercials, or just hanging out with friends. <laughs> so those are the things coming up. So I believe those are all the announcements. May this week bless you. At, uh, from week to week, because, you know, she's in the back with the kids and that kind of stuff, so it gives us a chance to at least see her digitally if uh, we don't physically. But, uh, so, go ahead and pull out your sermon outlines if you'd like uh, as we continue our series on Next Steps that we look at essential next steps that any one of us can take, no matter where we are in our faith, that will help jumpstart our journey. Now, let me confess something to you. I believe wholeheartedly that these six steps, these things that we are going to be talking about over the next few weeks and that we started a couple weeks ago, is exactly where, for me, as, as, as a pastor who's been in ministry for decades, I find that this is the battleground. 
This is the battleground where I am going to face head-on the spiritual forces, that it's going to make the difference between really having a holy experience with God, a life filled with a divine purpose, or whether I'm going to retreat into my own small little world and my own small little mind. Two weeks ago, we talked about uh, having a daily time with God. This week, I think we're going to be talking about something maybe a little bit more difficult as we talk about a weekly worship together. Because I think the first habit we need to have is a daily time with God. That you, if, if certainly it'd be great if we were spending the entire day with God, that we had a sense of being in continuous prayer and continuous relationship with Him. That's certainly the goal. But at least starting out until we get better sense of that, time with God each day. Well, now we're going to talk about this weekly gathering, this weekly worship together. And I think the reason this one is particularly difficult is because it is so countercultural. It is exactly the opposite of where our culture, specifically our culture here in the Northwest, uh, Portland specifically, go. Because most people don't care. Most people just don't care. I mean, that's certainly true regionally. This is, uh, you're not going to be able to read this very well, but this is the 20 most unchurched cities in America. This is done by Barna Research. Uh, You see the little Barna thing up here. And it's the top ones. And this is the percentage of people in that region who have not gone to church any time in the past six months. Unless they went, you know, for a wedding or a funeral. So not counting weddings and funerals, how many times have you gone at least one time in the past six months? And about half of people in Portland will say no. Half. Of the cities across America, we are in the area and region that makes the list. Now, you know, we're not San Francisco, where 60% say they haven't, but about 52% of people say, yeah, I went at least one time in the past six months. Most, uh, 48% say, no, not at all. Much less how often that actually happens. Matter of fact, more than half, closer to 60%, 57% of people believe, will say, they are simply just tired of the usual church experience. People that go to church, they're just tired of it. They're tired of it and the, what, what is usual, what is normal, that they are tired of it. So I believe these things hint at probably the number one barrier you and I culturally are going to face when it comes to worshiping together. And that is the question that we ask when we experience worship, when we go to church, when we have that, is do I like it? Do I like it? Do I like what is there? And now Christians, if you've been a Christian for a while, you're usually better. You're not going to be as blatant and as seemingly self-focused as do I like it. You'll, we'll put it in more spiritual language. We'll say things like, well, am I feeling fed? Was the Holy Spirit present? As if somehow the Holy Spirit couldn't be present. We will say things and and, uh, just find a way to hide it, but really what we're asking is, do I like it? Is it the way I would do it? Now you might ask, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with worshiping the way I like? And I will tell you that there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great to be able to worship in ways that matter to you, that fit for you. I was talking with my son a few weeks ago and we were referencing the verse about how it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and admitting that maybe some of those are easier for us than others and using whatever venue works for you. We did a a, uh, Bible series or a Bible study series uh, a couple years back and we were challenged to go out. It says, you know, a lot of people really experience God really well in nature. They just, they feel really close to God, you know, throwing a fishing hook into a stream up in the mountains on a beautiful and clear day. 
And so in an anticipation of doing that, they say, so go out, go out into nature, contemplate that, see if you might see God. And so I dutifully did what I was supposed to, and I parked out here in the parking lot and sat in my car. Because that's about as nature as I'm going to get. But instead, and, and I contemplated nature. I contemplated the nature of reality. I started thinking about how the, the seat that I was sitting in, that the atoms and the, the material there, that mainly there's ma- mostly space between those things, that it's, it's not as solid as I might imagine, that, that there isn't much of space, and that the, what is holding me up is a series of strange electromagnetic impulses from reality that I think of as solid, but frankly, in many ways, is not. I started thinking about the complexity of of reality and how God has made this, and as we get smaller and smaller, that there becomes less and less ability for us to distinguish between one quark and another and and all these things. And, And I was just praising God in the middle of sitting in my car in the parking lot. Because that works for me. A fishing hook in a stream somewhere is not. And I say that knowing I'm the weird one. That most of you, seeing a beautiful landscape, seeing something, just really sense the presence of God. And so I would say that there was nothing wrong with me sitting in the car praising God for the atoms in my car seat. Any more than there's anything wrong with somebody praising God as they hear the babbling brook. Whatever it takes, great. Whatever works for you, that's amazing. You want, you need to listen to music? You want to dance? Do it. But what about us? What about this time? Well, I want to challenge you, frankly, on ways that that, that can really move us towards having a holy experience in worship together. And the challenge I have is that it is indeed a challenge. I don't think I can convince you. If really all we are is like... If, if you are in a place, I don't really care. I don't really see the point. And like I said, I think it is endemic. It is endemic to not only our culture in general, I think it's endemic to Christians who think, eh, you know, give or take, make it when I can. Yeah, I kind of like it, but, you know, I've got other things I'm doing and other things that are important and other stuff like that. That if, that if you're at that place and it's really, you don't really care that much, I don't think I can convince you to care. And I'm offering this in hopes that that I know some of us do. And literally, as I talk to people in this room, I know I'm almost literally preaching to the choir. But maybe some of those of you are online and you're doing that simply because you would like to be here, but you can't. And and then there are some who use the online experience, say, that is what I've got. But I, I want to at least challenge you to how you can make our time together a holy experience. And like I said, I I, I don't think I can convince you any more than I could have convinced my younger self how important dinners together were as a family. You know, my family would say most times at dinner, we'd all sit down at the dinner table and we'd all eat together. And it's like, well, I can get fed without being here in this room. I can have dinner without being with my family. And nothing you could have told me would have convinced me of its importance. It's only years later, as I have become a parent myself, where I see how vital it is that we are together as a family. And I don't know how I would have convinced my younger self. I've thought about that. What would I say? No, no, it's really important. The relationship, the connection, the stuff that happens, the the indescribable things, not just the details. It's not just that we're eating food and using a fork and and getting sustenance. Like all those things are important, but but there but there's other stuff that, that you can't really measure. Just having the conversation about your day, just seeing one another, just being present with one another, that matters. And and but I don't think my younger self would have been able to understand that. So I offer this to you for those of you who may understand why it is important that we gather and how you can up that experience. And for those of you who are still pretty much you're unconvinced that it's important, maybe one day when you do find that it's important, maybe you can remember some of these techniques that may indeed help you to take this next step. So the first and the first blank in your outline is not going to be is not going to be make sure you worship. 
because I don't think that's really an option for us. The truth is, you will worship. I w love the way David Foster Wallace put it. I, I don't think I've read anything by David Foster Wallace. He, I couldn't tell you a single thing he's done. But one of the things he did is he gave a speech once, uh, a commencement speech. And he had this phrase that I just find so compelling. As he says, what? I went too far ahead. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. See, what he's saying, and what I find just absolutely compelling, is, is that he's arguing, and I find the truth of this, that there is for all of us something central to our ongoing lives. Something that we say, without that, life isn't worth living. David Foster Wallace goes on, but others have done this as well, is to say, you know, what that might that be? If that's, if that's you know, pleasure, if there's a certain kind of pleasure, maybe certain substances that are important to you and that, that you can have, and if you have that, then life is good, and if you don't have it, then it's not good. Well, at some point, those things will not have the kind of response you need, will no longer feel the way you need to feel, and then what? If it's your beauty, that thing will fade. If it's a relationship, what happens if that's lost? At some point, no, you, if you put your things into the temporary and the now and the small, then it will ultimately destroy you. And this guy wasn't a Christian, at least as far as I know, but he tied into something that is absolutely true, that you and I worship something. When we are alone and we just daydream and we have no pressure to think about something or to solve something and we just are allowed to exist, what do we daydream about? That is a hint of what we worship. So I'm not going to tell you that we need to worship. I'm going to instead try to suggest that a holy experience in worship involves the proper object of worship. What do you make in the Ten Commandments when God literally says, you shall have no other gods before me? That he says, of one of the Ten Commandments, if we're going to list the ten things that, that, I, that as we're going to start off with the law, and I need you to understand some stuff, like here we are, we're going to write this down, let's start off with these big ten. Sure, there are more, and there are other ways of living this out, and there's a whole bunch more than just ten commandments in Scripture, but as we look at these ten, as we put these out, as, as I want to just give you the hint as, as we start, one of the ones that you need to know is you will have no other gods before me. Well, that sounds strange, there is no other god but God. Why would he even say that? Because what he is saying is, I know you're going to worship something. I know you're going to put something as God in your life, something that is going to be, this is more important than anything else. And I need to be first. Your life will not make sense. Your purpose will not make sense. Your eternity, you won't be fully who you are always meant to be if anything but me is first on that list. No other gods before me. Not your relationships, not your job, not your wealth, not your pleasure, whatever it is, your agenda, if it's anything else. Now, now that may fit in, then that may be important to you, but really what takes the top rung? You know, the th thing that's really interesting to me about this is not just that God says, don't have anything else. But something that, as I'm researching this, when I, when I, for this sermon, uh, one of the books that I really relied on was Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. Now, they, I, I have heard they say the difference between plagiarism and research is plagiarism is you steal from one source and research you steal from a lot of sources. This morning, the sermon is pretty much plagiarized. I really relied heavily on that book, Celebrations of Discipline. And, and if you haven't read it, if you're at all interested in different disciplines, he, he goes through about 12 different ones or more that, that are just really great. Uh, it's worth looking at, and I really highly recommend it. But I took a lot of that material, and, and specifically as we look at, at this one, 
he's the one who pointed out to me, he says, you know, have you read this verse, John 4, 23? And I have, and, and, and we'll read it again. Unplug mics so that they don't work. No, I think I plugged it back in. There you go. Um, whoops. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, I have heard that verse before. I've talked about it. I love that idea that God is looking for people that worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that's really fascinating to think. What is spirit? What is truth? And I think just to summarize it, for the most part, it, it really has to do with what's going on with our spirits. It has to go on with what's true. It's very little about the forms. You know, that when we ask, like, well, what's the proper way to worship? What's the proper forms? And how should we have church? And what things should we have in there and those it's not to say that those are unimportant but it's not the primary thing the primary thing is that we worship him in spirit and truth however we go about doing it the spirit and truth is what's key and and that's what captures my attention but richard foster points out something that you know i've read a zillion times but really stood out for they are the kind of worshipers the father seeks have you thought about the fact that God is seeking worshipers? He's looking for worshipers. He longs for that. That really when we worship, it is simply a response of us to the divine calling in the first place. That we respond to God seeking and calling us. That ultimately, worship is less about, do I like it, and more about, does God like it? Not, was that good, but did I do a good job showing God His due? So the first is we need the proper object to worship. Anything less and it will be, well, less than holy. Second, and the second blank in your outline, is we need a people of worship. This is where we talk about community. See, ultimately, as we gather in community, we are going to worship differently than we might on our own. We're going to worship differently. I, I doubt any of you, if you, you had a daily time with God this morning or maybe yesterday, and you had a daily time with Him, I, I doubt very many of us said, well, let's gather a bunch of people and let's run a service and have songs like this and have a prayer and have announcements. Like, I, does, did anybody do that yesterday? Well, besides me? No, no, I didn't do it either. Because we do things differently, that, that in many ways when we come together to worship, and as we do it together, we adapt in ways that we can do it together. We adapt to one another. We do it differently. So to tell a story, not my story, again from, from Richard Foster's book, he said he took it, he had read about some, some monks and Brother Lawrence and some others who kind of lived this real daily presence of God. And he said, I took, he took, decided to take on this experiment. He goes, for an entire year, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to be so super aware, as best as I can, about the ever presence of Christ trying to teach me. And look for the littlest things. You know, maybe, maybe when I see somebody crossing the street and I'm drawn to their attention, maybe that's God asking me to pray for that. As, as I see little signs in the world and I look and I'm constantly looking and, and anticipating that God is going to do something. And I constantly look for Him to speak to me in these small ways over and over. And as Richard Foster talks about it, he says, you know, it didn't always work. He says sometimes, you know, he would, he would go hours, maybe even days between a recognition of that and thinking about it. He had to keep coming back to it. But here's what he says. He says, that year did many things for me, but it especially heightened my sense of expectancy in public worship. 
After all, he had graciously spoken to me in dozens of little ways throughout the week. He will certainly speak to me here as well. In addition, I found it increasingly easier to distinguish his voice from the blare of everyday life. You see, ultimately what he is saying is that he came with an expectancy to hear God in worship together, to see God move together. Which is so radically different. I, I had a buddy, Rod, Rod Hamilton, uh, had led some Bible studies of a church I was a part of down in Southern California, and he, I don't, I don't remember how it came up, whether it was me complaining about the church I was attending or something else or how it came up, but he, he looked at me and he says, Bill, you know, I just feel like if I go into church and Scripture's being read, that I should be able to listen to Scripture I should be able to praise God. I should be able to confess my sins. And if I can't do that, then I got much larger problems than what did or didn't happen up front. And see, what he was saying is that God can work. God works in the midst of that. Are you expecting that to happen? Are you expecting to praise God? Are you expecting to hear Scripture? Are you expecting to to confess your sins? Are you expecting that God is going to do something among the people that worship together? Well, with that said, that there becomes this expectancy for us to gather together to see what God may say amongst us in ways that have been contributed to throughout the week, which is really where I'm going to end this morning as we talk about a preparation for worship. This is the how-to. I want to give you two, four, six different things that you could be doing to prepare so that this time together that our time and worship together is more poignant, is more set aside. The literal word of holy literally means to be set aside for God's purposes. To set aside this time and how you can do that. The first is daily worship experiments. That you're experimenting with different forms of worship throughout your week. That you, you know, you just try it. Certainly daily, we talked about that last week. But maybe you can try something. Maybe you can sing. Maybe there's something we did here this morning, maybe one of the songs, and you could gather. Maybe literally re-listening. Uh, you know, we have these online. We not only put it on our website, we have it on our YouTube channel. You can go back and say, hey, I'd like to hear that again, or I want to reflect again. I'm just going to remind myself. It's going to take however much time I sat there before, but I'm, I'm just going to do that and, and listen to it again to be reminded that there are ways, and you can just experiment. Maybe it's it's going for a run. Maybe it's helping somebody else who needs help as you pray, whatever it might be, to experiment with different forms of worship when you get a chance. And some of them might not do much for you. You know, you take the chance, you go out by the brook and throw in a hook and look at the beautiful scenery and go, yeah, this is just wet, I'm done. But others may just hit you and you're like, yes. And as we experiment with different forms of worship, it better prepares us to be able to adapt to one another as we gather. Secondly, pray for the leaders. Now that can seem really self-serving as I ask you to pray for me, but I need it. I need it. You know, each week we gather together and, and try to offer what I have. And that's something really funny. I heard Reinhold Niebuhr say once, he goes, you know, the prophet's Uh, spoke when they are inspired, I have to do it every week. And and I have to tell you, that's not the the hard part. The hard part is the, you know, just like any of us, right? We, we, there are some weeks and some things that it's just, it's, it's been a harder time and a bigger struggle spiritually than at other times. And I face those and I need, I need your prayers. I need your prayers for the pressure that I, that I might face that, that to say something that's, um, you know, that would be easier to hear as opposed to the bold thing that Christ may want me to say instead. So I would ask that you pray, that you would pray for me, that you would pray that I would be invigorated, that I would speak 
uh, boldly if God has told me to that I would speak his words and that any way that, that I may say something that isn't consistent that we would all forget it because that's literally what I pray. But it's not just self-serving because I'm not asking you just to pray for me. I'm asking you to pray for all of those who lead us in worship. Everybody who is up here this morning, including uh, Sean and Reason and Judah who are in the back helping us prepare to the people who are sitting on the heat, that there are people who show up to, to Lisa who's setting up the uh, coffee for us in the morning. All those to help us, to lead us into worship, to, to provide an environment that make it possible that we could gather and worship, that you pray for them, that you pray for their spirit, that you pray for their participation, that you are appreciative of, of what they're doing and to offer them before God, say, Lord, as they help us practice your presence, Lord, will you just instill them with your presence? So pray for your leaders. Three, pay attention to others. I think one of the greatest things you can do is you sit in the morning and, and people are coming in or that kind of stuff and you just take notice. Like I'm looking around here and I see that you're all pretty much sitting in the same place as you always sit. That's okay. That's all right. But pay attention. Maybe, maybe you see somebody come in and their shoulders are a little drooped. And you think, man, I don't know what's going on, but I bet they need some prayer. So right here, right now, I'm going to intercede for them. I'm just going to pray. They don't need to know. But that I'm praying anyway for them. Or maybe just be in, paying attention to what's going on and, and very much pay attention to others so that you might realize that we're doing this as a community. Number four, prepare Saturday night. I mean, what if on Saturday night before we came to service, uh, you know, you had a time of, of confession. You had a time, you know, you know, typically uh, you may know what we're going to be preaching about or talking about, probably not, but maybe you review some of the songs we had in the past week. Maybe you sing some of that. Maybe you uh, just anticipate maybe that's part of your prayer time and you're praying for the leaders and you're praying for the and you just prepare maybe preparing is literally just going to bed earlier on a saturday night so that you can get up earlier on a sunday morning and do what you need to do a willingness to gather that really that that working on that part that i can't convince you of that just says you know what i consider this important Again, Richard Foster from Celebrations of Discipline. That, that is, as an individual, I must learn to let go of my agenda, of my concern, of my being blessed, of my hearing the word of God. The language of the gathered fellowship is not I, but we. There is a submission to the ways of God. There is a submission to one another in Christian fellowship. Maybe that's why this topic is so difficult. Because submission is an ugly word in our culture. Submission that says, I am here this morning, not for me, but for you. I am not here for me, I am here for we. That maybe it's my presence and my that, that I will look for ways I can pray and I can serve and I can be part of something that it's not about what I get, it's about what I give. Again, I can't think of anything more countercultural but a willingness to say, I will take that. Because if you approach church and approach our gatherings as what will I get out of it, and that's all you ever see, I guarantee you will be stunted in your spiritual growth. And then lastly, offer a sacrifice. There's something really powerful in Scripture, you know, the whole nature of sacrifice and the whole sacrifice of animals, and Scripture tells us why that whole thing was set up to understand and, and to help us point to Jesus and the ultimate sacrifice that He made for us. But one of the things it's talking about being a living sacrifice for us to sacrifice before the Lord, maybe one of the sacrifices we may need to make from week to week is a sacrifice of worship. That just says, you know what, I, I don't really feel like it this morning. I don't really, I'm not that into it. I'm, I was kind of tired and cranky and I had some bad pepperoni last night and um, like I'm just, I, I just don't have it all there. But you know what? God, what little I have, what little motivation I have, what little energy I have, I'm here and I give to you and I give to your people. There's something holy about that and that 
that God is willing to take. I mean, after all, what does worship mean? Worship literally comes from the word for worthy. You know, like we talk about friendship is the state of being friends. A relationship, the state of being in relation to one another. Worship is worthy ship. It is literally meaning the state of recognizing the worthiness of God. That God is worthy beyond my feelings. God is worthy beyond my agenda. God is worthy. And so I gather together. You realize the early church understood this. They, they gathered together when their very lives were in danger. Are we willing to sacrifice our agenda for a chance to gather and worship for the Lord? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the fact that uh, those who have sacrificed to be able to be here to that we might worship together. I thank you for their participation to sing songs together that may not have been songs we picked to listen to a sermon that that might not have been the topic we had woke up thinking about, to spending time and sharing with one another that people we might not otherwise have gathered with. But we do so in submission to you, and we offer this sacrifice of praise and are glad to be able to have given it. Lord, I, I, I recognize and I feel badly. I mean, that, that this can feel kind of condemning, if not just convicting, um, to those who are online or who hear about this after the fact, who were willing to skip out for reasons that had less to do with holiness and more to do with their own agenda. Not because they couldn't, but because they wouldn't. And as always, Lord, I ask for the, your grace, not only for them, but for me, for the days when I think, eh, I'm not really putting my heart into it, for the days that I may otherwise have just been reluctant Lord, I am, I am stunned by your grace that just says, I, I, I know, I know, I know. I forgive you. Let's just start again. And so, Lord, once again, I start over. Forgive me. Help lead me on. You are worth it. In Jesus' name, amen.